Hi, this is Joe Quinn with another edition of In One Era and Out the Other. This time, the V-Discs of World War II. This is a uh, recording I'm making for you, Joe Quinn. Hi, Joe. Thank you very, very much for sending your tape. I enjoyed it very, very much. First off, uh, I'll get you squared away in my name. It's pronounced Ed Dijon Antonio. D-I is like D-E-E. G-I-A-N-N is like John. And then Antonio. Dijon Antonio. My nickname is D-G. D-I-G-I. What I'm going to do, Joe, is to uh, go through this uh, uh, program I have and pretend that you're asking me questions, and then I will respond. I've been asked uh, many, many times, uh, DG, uh, why are you doing this program? Well, there are several reasons. First of all, we have the 50th anniversary of World War II coming up, and I'd like to tell you what we did during World War II boost and sustain the morale of our GIs. We had three principal things going on. One, we sent uh, musical instruments overseas, enough for a complete band plus the associated music. We had the very, very famous V-Mail, and of course, uh, V-Discs. Uh, V-Discs were purported to be the largest uh, contributor to morale of any one of the, of the uh, programs the services had. Initially, uh, we were sending a, a box of 30 records uh, overseas, and as demand grew, we had to cut it to 20. And uh, what I'm going to do is to give you some idea, uh, uh, because I've been asked again, say, DG, uh, what were the artists, and who were the artists that recorded uh, on VDIS? I'm going to read a few just to give you an inkling and to sort of tease you, but in the Swing jazz, of course, we had Benny Goodman, Tommy Dorsey, Lionel Hampton, Duke Ellington, Bunny Barrigan, Woody Herman, Fats Waller, Count Basie, Harry James, Tony Pastor, Stan Kenton, Teddy Wilson, Jimmy Dorsey, Bob Crosby, Hal Kemp, Red Novel, Charlie Burnett, John Kirby, Les Brown, Gene Krupa, Will Bradley, Louis Armstrong, Jack T. Garden, Muggsy Spanier, Glenn Gray, Lou Prima, Earl Hines, Jess Stacy, Art Tatum, Buddy Rich, Billy Butterfield, Buddy Hackett, Claude Thornhill, and so many, many others. Vocals. E.G., who are some of the uh, vocalists that uh, appeared in the VDS? Well, of course, Bing Crosby, a very, very young Mel Torme, a young Sinatra, Dinah Shore, Evelyn Knight, Lena Horn, Connie Boswell, Perry Como, Mildred Bailey, Martha Tilton, Helen O'Connell, Bob Everly, Brother Ray Everly, Peggy Lee, Dick Hames, Billy Holiday, Andrew Sisters, Joe Stafford, King Sisters, B. Wayne, K. Star, Lee Wiley, Ella Mae Morris, Pearl Bailey, uh, a very, very young Tony Bennett, Buddy Clark, Doris Day, uh, Helen uh, Forrest, and so on. We even had uh, uh, country western singers like Spike Jones, Roy Acuff, Gene Autry, Cass Daly, Roy Rogers, and so on. Uh, we uh, had a category of uh, uh, classical that I'm not going to uh, be releasing on this VDS. What I'm concentrating on now is strictly the big bands uh, because I think that's my initial demand. Another question they asked me, why are you doing this? Well, I'm doing it for, for several reasons. One, all the work that was done on VDS was strictly on a, on a contributory basis. The recording companies, the movie companies, uh, the studios, uh, the very, very wonderful work done by all the artists, their talent and time was absolutely for nothing. To date, no one has ever given any appreciation or one ounce of recognition to the fact that these guys did such a tremendous job in boosting um, the morale for our troops. Again, I've been asked, well, what was the mission of the VDIS program? Well, what it did for the GIs was to bring music from home. It was a link to home and a link to the wives and husbands and sweethearts and so on. And what was different about V-Dist uh, was the fact that each kit that went out had a questionnaire in it. And the questionnaire said, uh, what tune did you like the best? Which did you like the least? What would you like to hear in the future? And uh, the GIs were asked to fill these in. Thousands came back every month. They were tabulated. And this gave us an inkling as to what type of music that the GIs wanted in the future releases. Um, we also had questions like, uh, 
how'd you play these? Uh, and the reason why we said that is because they were played either on PA systems or played uh, on hand wound uh, machines, spring wound. The question came up uh, several times, Joe. I said, where did the GIs play these records? Well, they played them in barracks, in mess halls, ward rooms, hospitals, foxholes, trenches, on airplanes. One guy wrote a letter and said they were on the way invading D-Day and playing V-Disc. I got another letter from a fellow that was on a destroyer bombarding Iwo Jima, and he said they were playing V-Disc that the bombardment was going on. Another fellow was in a jeep in the Battle of the Bulge uh, with the Germans a few miles ahead. They were playing V-Disc. And, of course, what made this possible was the fact, as I said earlier, that we sent 125,000 spring-wound, hand-wound record players uh, so the GIs didn't have to rely on batteries or any electricity. They just wound them up, put their head on the record, and away they went. Another question, Joe. Uh, you might ask me, well, how did this program come about? At the very beginning of the war, uh, the Army was sending commercial shellac records overseas, 10-inch records. And by the time they get, got there, we were getting an 80 to 85 percent breakage. These were 10-inch 78 RPM records. A very spunky little Army captain named Bob Vincent, uh, who had been in the class of 22 at Yale and also worked for Thomas A. Edison as a young guy, went to the Army brass and said, look, we should set up a special program called BDIS, and we ought to augment the stuff we get from the libraries with live artists. And uh, he managed to locate a million dollars of un un unallocated funds and got the BDIS program going. We had a couple of things, uh, obstacles, as I mentioned earlier, one was the breakage, which we solved by pressing the records out of vinylite, which is virtually unbreakable. And secondly, we had to get permission from the American Federation of Musicians to record uh, artists. So we went to Petrillo and uh, we said, this is what we'd like to do. We'd like to record live guys and send the music overseas to the GIs. Now, what made the fact that he gave us permission Important was that at the time, there was a recording strike on, a recording ban. Because the record companies refused to pay uh, the musicians a royalty, uh, from August, 40, August 1942 until November 44, no commercial records were made in the United States, except for Vegas. Another thing was that we were able to take artists from any company, whatever company they're under contract to, and put them on Vegas. So... On those two counts alone, Joe, uh, made during the recording ban, made by artists from different labels, these are really very rare birds. Uh, funny story about going to the Colonel Bronson, who's our boss, about VGIS. He said, look, guys don't want to hear uh, swing and jazz and what have you. They want to hear, mu they want to hear music. They want to hear marches, I mean. So Bob went to Glenn Miller and said, Glenn, uh, Colonel wants marches. He doesn't think the GIs want to play big band music. This is what led Glenn to arrange the very famous St. Louis Blues March. Of course, uh, you know what happened. Uh, the Colonel changed his mind and V just became very, very popular. As a matter of fact, about 80% of the tunes were big band stuff. Shortly after the V just program was formulated, uh, the Army went to the Navy and said, uh, would you like to take part in the program? And the Navy said a couple of things. One, well, we didn't think we needed to boost the morale of the Navy guys. And number two, we don't have a viable candidate. Well, luckily, this is how I got in the program, because while I was uh, in Milford High School and Brookline High School, I played uh, piano, sax, and clarinet, then went on to MIT and played in the big band, uh, I mean the uh, marching band, and also in a, a dance band. And one day going home, I heard this wonderful clarinet playing at the Raymore Ballroom in Boston. And... Uh, looked in the Playmore Ballroom, and Artie Shaw was holding an afternoon rehearsal. Well, as a young ham operator, I built my own recording equipment, so I went up to Artie and said, I'd like to, I'd like to record your show tonight. And he, in effect, said, Kid, everything I get is lousy, you know, don't do it. I did it anyway. Artie liked it, and I went on uh, to uh, have me record Glenn Miller when he came in after Artie did, and then, of course, I uh, also recorded Benny Goodman and a lot of bands around the Boston area. Well, how did I get in again? Well, I was supposed to go to Lockheed in 1940. Instead, I joined the Navy in what was going to be a one-month cruise. They declared the national emergency. 
Uh, I never got out of the Navy. I was commissioned an ensign in November 1940 aboard the USS Vincennes. Tooled around for a year and a half. The ship was finally sunk at Guadalcanal. Uh, I was wounded, uh, but was one of the so very, very few survivors from the engineering department. And to make a long story short, when I got out of the Naval Hospital, just about that time, uh, the Navy had noticed in my credentials that I had had a recording experience and knew a little about music. And so they assigned me to the Navy program uh, in New York, reporting to the uh, general who was head of the Army Service Forces at that time. 